Welcome to another video from Lockdown Electronics with me Bill and this time we're going to be taking a look at a couple of digital integrated circuits or gates and we're going to be looking at the similarities and also the differences between an inverter and a Schmidt trigger. They're both forms of not gate but they've actually got some, some interesting properties that, uh, that separate them. So let's start by having a look at the gates themselves. Okay let's start by looking at um, the inverter. It has the symbol thus and the Schmidt trigger has almost the same symbol except it's got another symbol inside the triangle to identify the uh, fact that it's a Schmidt trigger rather than just an inverter. Now the similarities are that they're both not gates that is to say they have the truth table such that if the input is low the output will be high and if the input is high the output will be low and in that sense they have an identical function. Today then we're going to make use of the 74LS04 which is a hex inverter. We'll just make use of uh, one of the gates for the purposes of the, of the tests and we're also going to use the CD40106B which is uh, another hex pack of uh, uh, Schmidt triggers and again we'll just use one. And for completeness, I'm also going to include uh, the 74LS00, which is a quad pack of NAND gates. And if you remember from a previous video, uh, I did talk about the NAND gate, sometimes being called the universal gate, because it's possible to configure NAND gate to simulate uh, pretty much all other types of logic gates, should you so desire. And I thought it might be handy to just wire up a NAND gate in this fashion such that the two inputs are connected together and in that fashion the NAND gate will actually function as a NOT gate in the same fashion as the hex inverter and the, and the Schmidt trigger should, should do. So I thought it might be just be handy to compare the performance of, of an inverter and a NAND gate configured to be uh, an inverter and see if they really are the same. Okay let's start by having a look um, how all this looks on the breadboard. Okay, this is the general arrangement for looking at uh, the properties of these particular logic ICs. So on the breadboard here I've got hex inverter there, the NAND gate here, and finally the Schmidt trigger on the right hand side there. There's just one or two capacitors here to clean up uh, one or two noisy edges, and apologies for the rat's nest of scope probes, it's difficult to um, avoid anything else, but since we're not going to spend too much time uh, bothering with um, what that looks like. It's what's happening on the scope that it interests us. I think we can probably live with that. So then, looking at the scope traces, here you've got at the top the yellow trace is a 1 kilohertz uh, wave, square wave, and it isn't um, a conventional wave because it doesn't cross zero. It starts at 0 volts and goes up to plus 5 volts, so it's operating as a as a clock might do let's say on a, on a computer or a microprocessor of some sort. So that's the input. The purple trace on channel 2 is the output from the inverter and as you might expect we're actually getting an inverse waveform which is the clues in the name it's an inverter so it's doing its job nicely. The blue trace is the NAND gate which I've configured as an inverter as I explained um, earlier on the slides and you can see its performance is pretty much identical to, to the inverter. And then finally at the bottom we've got the Schmidt trigger again producing an inverted waveform and certainly in this example um, you might be tempted to say well there isn't any difference because there isn't they're all doing exactly the same job and indeed they are and in this application you could use um, any of those uh, to, uh, to achieve that result. So let's now have a look what happens when we have a different input signal and uh, because it's the easiest way to do this I'm just going to flick from square wave to sine wave on the signal generator. I'm going to do that now. So I've got a 1 kilohertz sine wave again it's rising up from 0 to 5 volts and um, so it's a sine wave in the sense that it's uh, sinusoidal waveform but remember it doesn't cross zero and straight away you can see a marked difference in the inverter 
and the NAND gate they're producing a pulse but it's a pulse with a round top and it's considerably narrower than it was before the Schmidt trigger on the other hand is still producing a square output it's either 0 or 5 volts but you notice if I just flick back to, to square wave for a moment you notice there is a change in the duty cycle so the response is different but it's duty cycle that changes rather than voltage response so let's now have a look in a little bit more detail about what's going on with those waveforms okay so I've reconfigured the scope now and I'm using a triangular wave simply because it's easier to spot the voltage changes than it would be on a a sine wave. Uh, it's running from 0 to 5 volts, still got the same 1 kilohertz. That's the signal that's going in from the signal generator on channel 1. So if we turn on channel 2, which is the uh, inverter, as you can see we've got this rather strange pattern that occurs. Uh, we certainly do get to 5 volts, but actually um, there's still that uh, sort of pointed shape on the top of the waveform. If we drop some cursors on, I've got uh, the lower cursor is on zero volts. And if we look there, we can see that uh, where the inversion occurs is at about, um, the delta is about, well, it's just about one volt roughly there. And it returns back at about one volt. So that's the hex inverter. If we turn on channel three, which is the, NAND gate configured as an inverter. As you can see, I've got them both on there, you can probably see. It's pretty much identical. We'll turn off the inverter now. So that's just the NAND gate configured as a, an inverter and pretty much identical performance. And again, inversion occurs when the wave crosses with pretty much the same voltage. It's around about a volt. Okay, now let's have a look what happens with the Schmidt trigger. And as you can see, we've got a very different state of affairs going on here. First of all, it's either 0 or 5 volts, which is certainly a significant thing, and we'll have a talk about what that's, what's going on there in a moment. But what I'd like you to note from this particular display is if we now adjust the cursor up there, inversion occurs at about roughly 2.12 volts, and it returns to the low state uh, when the wave crosses about 2.82 volts. So there's a significant difference between uh, onset and completion. And that's certainly one of the things that a Schmidt trigger uh, is used for, that that property is used for. Uh, why is that useful? Well, that's what we'll look at next. Okay, so now we've got the scope displaying uh, a bit of a more random waveform. And let's see how our three different types of uh, logic gate respond to a waveform like this. So first of all, let's look at the inverter. And as you can see, rather a strange response, but certainly it, it, it sort of begins to invert a little bit on some of the positive going pulses um, and it manages to almost reach a full 5 volts on, on several occasions. If we look at the NAND gate that's configured as an inverter, uh, you can see um, very, very similar, uh, in fact almost identical. Uh, and finally I'm going to turn off the NAND gate to make the display less confusing. Just look at the Smith trigger and this hopefully is an illustration of why a Smith trigger is so useful in a, a computer or a, a, a microprocessor circuit because it's ignoring a lot of the pulses that don't actually reach 5 volts and it's only actually inverting when the state of the incoming wave actually does reach uh, the full 5 volts. So in other words, uh, a Schmidt trigger is very very handy at cleaning up um, an incoming uh, waveform that may have been distorted for whatever reason, whether it be by length of transmission line or uh, other factors. And if you're a microprocessor, uh, you're going to find the green trace uh, with a sudden negative going pulse a lot easier to make some sense of than you would the, the purpley pink trace, which is what the inverter is producing. And certainly um, in terms of if, you, if timing is critical in accessing uh, 
uh, a particular chip then uh, having a, a very obvious change in state whether it be negative or positive is a much more palatable thing for the processor to to actually deal with so hopefully there you can see um, that um, in certain circumstances these circuits operate in exactly the same fashion but when it comes to dealing with more complex waveforms sometimes it's a Schmidt trigger that's going to be most useful in producing a waveform that is a little bit more uh, useful to, for use by other logic circuits. A Schmidt trigger then uh, differs from an inverter in that it's got two threshold voltages that allow its output to change state and it's that difference which um, characterizes its response to waveforms that are, are not perfect square waves. And that property comes in very handy if you want to clean up a signal, as you've seen previously. It's also quite handy to use the Schmidt trigger as a, as a square wave oscillator. It's, uh, with, with the addition of a resistor and a capacitor, you can actually produce um, very, very simple and very reliable oscillator circuit. OK, that's it for this time. I um, hope um, it's made some sense and you found it useful. I encourage you to perhaps have a look up some of the more technical details of Schmidt triggers um, and their origin, which is also quite fascinating. Um, if you've liked it, please click the thumbs up. If not, you can click the thumbs down. Either way, thanks very much for watching. Um, if you would consider subscribing, that would be great. And we'll see you on the next one.